My second research project as an undergraduate and my second published paper, I got to do something cognitive, something about how the human mind actually uh, makes sense of the world. And this was in a auditory perception laboratory run by Albert Bregman, my uh, advisor at the time, who was interested in how the uh, brain parses or makes sense of the auditory world. When you hear stuff, there's a lot of sound makers that are going off at the same time. There's the person you're talking to, there may be another conversation at the other next table, there might be uh, musical speakers, crickets chirping, ventilator hum. They all get smushed together into one very complicated waveform, most goes into the ear, and the uh, brain has to make sense of which sounds come from which sound maker. Uh, Bregman laid out some of the principles of uh, auditory scene analysis, many of which have close counterparts in visual scene analysis, in particular in what uh, every psychology student learns as the gestalt laws of grouping or organization, where uh, things that are next to each other tend to form a shape or, or, or pattern or configuration. The way when you're in a, a movie theater, for example, you often see a diagonal line of all the seats that line up. Laws of uh, apparent motion, if you have two flashing alternating lights, it looks like it hops back and forth. You see a V of geese overhead. Uh, it looks like a single V shape, not a bunch of individual geese flapping. Well, something similar happens in uh, the auditory world. Uh, but here, the two dimensions are frequency and time. So that tones or uh, bits of sound that are similar in pitch will tend to be grouped together by the brain as a stream or a melody or continuous sound. If there's too big a jump between a pitch and the next one, then it doesn't sound like they're connected as a, a kind of melody, but just sounds like there are two things that are happening that kind of overlap in time. That was the uh, background, lots of uh, auditory demos. But it left open the question of how does the um, brain glue together simultaneous frequency components into a complex sound, uh, a sound with a rich timbre, T-I-M-B-R-E. This would be the difference between, say, the sound of a flute and a saxophone and an organ all playing the, the same pitch. They just sound different. They have a different kind of quality, even if they have the same pitch and the same volume. Well, what determines timbre is partly the attack, that is how the uh, loudness suddenly grows, depending on whether it's something is struck or plucked, but also the which sound components get mentally glued together into the same sound. It comes from a basic law of physics that when a long object vibrates, a string is plucked, a column of air vibrates, it not only gives off vibrations at a fundamental frequency, say 440 cycles per second, but also at, at multiples, 880, three times, four times, and so on. Uh, but not always perfect multiples, and uh, everything is happening at once. How do you glue together all the sounds that come from uh, the music, and all the ones that come from someone's voice, and all the ones that come from a, a ventilator? Al and I thought that some of the Gestalt laws would apply, that different frequency components that began and ended at the same time would get glued together, and also, if they were far enough away in pitch space, the ones that were close together would uh, hang together, and the ones that were farther away in pitch would be segregated away. And in a bunch of experiments with uh, various uh, beeps and boops, uh, we showed that that indeed was what the brain was doing. Relevant to artificial intelligence, when you've got Siri or your, your voice assistant will often have trouble if you are speaking to it in a noisy environment, but one that the brain does pretty well. What I found uh, interesting was that, as with a lot of research in perception, artists had discovered some of the principles before psychologists did, and that was true for the principles of auditory scene analysis. In particular, musicians had long known of a phenomenon called uh, virtual polyphony. That it, polyphony means uh, many sounds, and virtual polyphony is what happens when a very skilled instrumentalist plays alternating notes that are so far apart in pitch that the brain can't keep track of the jumps, and each one segregates into its own stream. So it's as if a single musician can play two melodies if he or she is 
dexterous and quick enough. The Telemann, for example, has a lovely piece that breaks into virtual polyphony. And the converse is that if you have two instruments playing where the notes are close enough in time and close enough in pitch, the brain might fuse them together and the two musicians can merge into a single melody. And I have a passage of African xylophone music from Burundi, quite a beautiful piece with two musicians who start separately, sounds like two different musicians, but are so good at timing that they exploit the way that the brain glues together pitches that are close in time and frequency and create the illusion of a single melody uh, merging from their playing, which then splits apart and comes together again. Uh, quite an exquisite piece and a lovely example of how art and science come together in the understanding of perception.